second time's a charm. Uh, my other camera decided not to uh, save all the information, at least uh, save it onto the card and let me upload it on my computer. <laughs> Everything got uh, corrupted somehow, but um, anyways, I'm going to be going through, um, first I'm going to go through some of the basic tools that um, every fly tire is going to need, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more specialty tools, some stuff that I figured out that's um, handy to have around on the way. And um, I'm going to go through a little bit on how some of these are used or how I use them. And then um, in the second part of the video you'll see I'm going to actually show you how to practice with different materials and your tools and um, show you how to work around some of these things. So um, anyways we're going to get started. The, um, probably one of the most important things to do is get yourself a good pair of scissors and um, you know obviously you're going to need uh, bobbin holder and whip finish tool and all that stuff but I think that stuff you can get away with some of the cheaper end stuff but the scissors you really want to get yourself a nice pair and um, Dr. Slick I think makes some of the, the best scissors and um, one of the first ones that you might want to look at is uh, these are some all-purpose scissors and I'm sorry if this stuff isn't in frame uh, I'm not able to see what you guys are seeing right now so um, kind of bear with me it's you know first time filming on this camera so um, these all-purpose scissors are you know like they sound they're they're all-purpose um, they work well for just about any material they're tough durable and they are still really sharp but um and what I've been going towards is my favorite pair of scissors are these uh, Dr. Slick razor scissors. And they've got this uh, little fancy knob on here for adjusting the tension. And, you know, they're super, super sharp, super thin blades. Um, and they will cut just about anything that you need to cut. But um, for reasons that we're going to talk about later, you don't want to cut everything with them. But um, as you can see, the like I said, the blades on these are really thin. Where the all-purpose scissors differ is that if you guys can see this at all the actual cutting surface on these is fairly thick and that's good for um, some of the not necessarily dense, denser but the thicker materials and um, they're a little bit more stout than the uh, uh, razor scissors are and that makes them good for you know all around cutting um, these are really good for sharpen you know precise cutting you can cut up really close to the fly with these but um you know you want to take precautions to save these you know you want these to be really sharp they're, they're not cheap they're not super expensive i mean for a pair of scissors i think they're you know 20 25 bucks somewhere around there but they're uh, they're definitely worth every penny but um because you're paying so much for these and because you want them to last as long as possible um you're not going to go around cutting everything with them um in particular um, hair, wires, um, you know, the denser synthetic materials, stuff like that, those will dull these out really quick. And um, because of that, we have more specialty scissors. You know, I, I use uh, all purpose scissors, I, I keep them around for um, some of the thicker ma synthetic materials, uh, you know, some. Uh, French tinsel, stuff like that, but um, most of the time these end up going in my travel bag, for uh, travel tying bag, I guess. Uh, just as good all-purpose scissors, I'll do anything I need to do. But um, I I started out, you know, I, I collected scissors. I had the you know fancy carbide ones with the black handles and micro tips and all this stuff. But I've I really figured out that these and a pair of these here, we'll go over what these are in a second, and these, the uh, doctors like hair scissors, and I particularly like the uh, curved design, and um, these are really good for hair. Um, hair will dull your scissors really quick, I don't know necessarily what it is, but it's uh, slightly abrasive, I guess, but um, these, they have that same, as like the all-purpose scissors, really thick cutting edge, and um, if you look really closely on these, uh, this side has a uh, serration on the cutting edge, and that helps 
grab the materials and keep them inside the cutting edge of the scissors and um, this cuts hair really really well and I, I like the the curve design because um, it's really good on like muddler heads or uh, spun deer heads and stuff like that because you just butt these up against the eye of the hook and you can just trim and it'll give you a perfect shape all the way around and also uh, when you're cutting hair off of the skin um, what you can do is you know you set this down on your bench and then you can pull up a clump with, clump with one hand and then come in and trim them off really close to the, the skin whereas if you were trying to do that with say a, a straight pair of scissors you know, you'd have to get in really close to the table and it's kind of awkward or you know do this this thing here where it's you know you might not get a straight cut not everything's going to be the same and you know so on and so forth but um, really like these deer hair scissors and then we also have these scissors and these are um, just uh, Rapala uh, super line or you know braided line scissors and um, that's something you might know I, I do use a uh, braided line usually 20 or 30 pound braided line for uh, articulation section in some of my flies so that's um, great to keep these around for but they're also really really good for um, those thick synthetic materials that will dull out all your other scissors really quick and um, you know they're really big heavy duty scissors are great for cutting bulky materials and I, I think they're like $4.99 or something like that and you can get them at just about any Walmart so, um, handy to have around, really good. Um, anyways, that's more or less scissors. You know, you, you do get a decent set of scissors in some of the um, kits, you know, but they're they're okay. They'll dull out pretty quick, and you, they, you won't get the nice, precise cutting that you will with some of the nicer doctors like ones. And um, next that you're going to need is a bobbin holder. And this is... A, I think this, just a cheap Griffin one that came with my vise, and um, this one has been great. I keep it around all the time, and this is what I do 99% of my tying with. Um, yeah, there are uh, basically two different kinds. There's ones with the uh, ceramic insert, like on this one, and then there's uh, uh, plain steel ones. And people complain about the ceramic ones all the time because you know they think that it's scoring their thread or you know cutting or fraying things and 90% of that's from um, using those uh, bobbin threaders that you get in kits and you, know, you can pick up anywhere, but um, what's that doing? If you're jamming a piece of metal in there that can scratch up the ceramic surface and it can even scratch up the metal surface too. So um, what you can do to avoid that is, I mean, for a while I was using you know, a piece of 5X with a little loop on the end and just pull it through. and um, can pull your th thread through that way but the easiest way that I found is I'm just kind of scroll that out but um, so when you get your thread on your bobbin you just take the end and um, stick it on or you know near the this hole in the back and then it's not bound up there we go just suck it through and that you know you're never going to damage the inside of your bobbin that way and um, it's really quick it's a lot quicker than you know searching around on your desk for that little piece of 5x or uh, for that bobbin threader it's just really quick um, I started doing that you know I read something online about it and you know, I thought oh well I'll just keep using my tool but I started doing it that way because you know I'd, I'd lose that that little tool around on the desk somewhere and you know, it's been 10 minutes looking for it when I could have just done that. And super quick and easy. And um, Anyways, um, what a lot of people I hear complaining about is that, um, you know, they're getting their new set and they're getting ready to tie. And every time that they try to start the thread on it, it's breaking the thread. And most of that's from, you know, these uh, bobbin holders. You know, they ship, you know, crossed like that or at least, you know, really close together. And what you got to do is take these arms and just bend them out. I mean, you're not going to break them, at least not, you know, unintentionally, and um, spread them out a bit. And that way, you know, your spool of thread will fit in there really easily, and um, there won't be any tension on it, and you can 
um, start your thread and never worry about it breaking. And, um, you know, there are uh, certain bobbins around there. I think that's a uh, right braba, right, the <laughs> sorry, right bobbin with the uh, adjustable drag on the side. And, you know, I, I've never really had a chance to play around with those. Um, I've always wanted to get a hold of one, but just never really did. But um, those are fine. You can adjust the drag, but the problem is that you can't adjust the drag on the fly. And um, what I mean by that is, you know, as you're tying the fly, you can't. Um, increase or lessen the drag you know whenever you want to or whenever you need to it's you know that sets uh drag tension which i mean there there might be a way to do it i'm not sure of it like i said i've never been able to play around with one but um all i do is that i just uh these arms to the point where it'll hold the um bobbin and the thread just like this you know hanging on the hook and it won't slide down by itself and you wind up with you know three feet of thread hanging out and you guys you know spool it all back up but uh, then all you do is it's kind of hard to show you guys this but you I grab onto the front right here where this little brass piece is grab onto that and then this cups into my fingers like that and I can adjust the tension on that spool just by you know squeezing or letting go or squeezing you know so it's it's easy to adjust that drag so I can get tight heavy wraps when I want to or I can get really nice you know loose finesse wraps if I need to and um, that's something we'll go over in the second part of the video why you would need to do that and when you need to do that but um, it, it does take some practice to get it right and to you know be able to really finely adjust that but it's definitely something worth learning and then the next tool is you know you get to the end of your fly what are you going to do and um, you can use half hitch tools and stuff and that's how i started out before i took the time to learn how to work with one of these and it's just a whip finish tool and as you can see this one spins really freely and that's you know, something that you'll you'll really appreciate if you get a bad pair and um grab a couple of the other ones here um, there's different sizes i believe this is kind of the standard size but um I've got one that's a little bit bigger and as you can see these uh, hooks the little hooks on the end here are different sizes and I really like these small short hooks because these uh, longer ones you know you have to when you finish up the fly and you will see this again in the second video when you have to pull this hook out on this there's more chance that there's a gonna be a burr or something on there that's can cause your thread to fray or break so and uh on this one the end is really square and flat off whereas this one is a little bit more rounded so i mean if you can get a pair that's you know spins really freely and is nice and smooth and doesn't have a lot of sharp angles or sharp corners on it then that's kind of the ideal pair and um you know it's it, it t does take some time to learn with these you know for some of the more experienced tires it's you know sounds funny but I mean, for longest time like i said i was using the half hitch tool and i just finally took the turn time to learn this and you know you end up with stronger flies you end up with um quicker tying because you don't have to sit there and mess with the half hitch tool a bunch but um you yeah, this is definitely a good good little tool to have in your arsenal some people do it by finger but this is really really easy even down to you know really small to really big flies so uh, next um actually real quick while we're on kind of this finishing up the fly section um this is another tool that you might need and um this is uh head cement and you know personally i think that uh, beginner fly tires should try to stay away from using head cement or super glue and stuff like that on their flies so that they can learn how to build stronger flies and better flies just by using thread and thread tension and there's obviously a few exceptions there you know, I mean, personally i haven't quite figured out how to tie with a uh, calf tail or a uh, squirrel tail yet without using some kind of adhesive and that's just you know something i've been working on for a while and um but yeah, it's, you will 
really see how quick a fly can come unraveled if it's tied poorly when you're out on the water. I mean, you, you can think that's a solid fly in the vise, but um, if it's loose wraps and you know poorly tied, and then you put a bunch of this on, you won't be able to see you know that you know judgment on the water. I guess you could say. So um, try to stay away from this while you're learning. And then, you know, obviously while I'm tying flies for customers or even, you know, for myself, it's, I, you know, douse everything in some kind of adhesive just to make sure that I'm giving them the most durable fly possible. But um, it really comes down to um, being able to tie that fly well before you move on to this. Because this is just a band-aid. I mean, it, it's a good band-aid, but it's just a band-aid. You know, you need to get your tying sorted out before you can move on to this. And I, I really like this style with the uh, um, little uh, needle in because that allows for really precise application of this. And then, um, you know, there's other styles with the, uh, like I got my black lacquer here with the uh, brush in there and then um, with super glue. And I've never used that gap before. I'm, I'm trying this stuff out and it, it works pretty good so far. But um, just with the, uh, dabbing end on there and um, I, I, I like the brush with the super glue but I, like I said I'm giving this a try all right so next up um, is a good hair stacker and I, I started out with a, a really bad hair stacker and um, it the problem with it was is that you know the this end here of the uh, stacking tube I guess you could say was flush with the the bottom of the base so whenever you pulled the hair out you had to sit there and try to fish the hairs out without getting everything um, unaligned and uneven so this one's really nice because it stops um, probably about a, about a quarter inch from the uh, bottom of the stacking tube so that way when you pull it out all the hairs right there it's all even you can just pull it out of there and um, this one's really nice. This one's a Rinzetti. Um, and this is kind of like a medium size. That's one that'll get, you know, 90% of your tying done, at least for, you know, trout flies. And uh, this one's got a nice little foam base pad, and I've never really appreciated that before, before I got this one. And um, it's a whole lot quieter and with uh, roommates in the house. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be making too much noise with this thing because it gets really annoying when you're trying to go through, you know, six dozen elk hair caddis. So, um, really nice to have that little bit of foam on there. I'll be probably doing that on all the, uh, all the hair stackers that I get from now on. Alright, and then you've got some bobbin, or bodkins. And these are uh, basically just needles on sticks. I put this one up down uh, Fort Collins. I... I really like this one. Um, it's got this really thin needle here, and it's got a long taper to the point. And uh, what you'll find on a lot of the uh, cheaper ones, that's it's a really, really thick needle, and it'll come to a really short taper to that point. And it's really hard to uh, clear the smaller eyes on uh, flies, or you know, pick out smaller bits of dubbing and stuff. You know, you wind up with pulling out all the dubbing on the fly with those bigger ones. So. Um, this one's been really great, and then uh, this one's about the same. It's a little bit thicker, so I can use it for bigger flies, but it's also got that long taper. And um, what I do a lot with these is I keep a uh, lighter on the table, and you can see it's all burnt up on the end. And um, I'd suggest keeping a cheap one around for this, but um, I just kind of did it with all of them, so these will probably end up in the scrap bin before too long. But um, you just heat that end up, and then uh, if you have hair or pretty much any fiber covering up the eye, you can just heat that up and melt it back or burn it back, and you'll have a clear eye. And you can use that to even shape materials too. Uh, just make sure you let it cool down before you go back to pick it up, because I've burned myself. I don't know how many times grabbing a hot bodkin when I thought it was cool. But uh, yeah, these are great tools to keep around. You know, pick out dubbing. Uh, you know pick out fibers that got trapped when you're wrapping a wire or something like that or clearing eyes so um, definitely good to at least have one or two of these around and then uh, that's 
pretty much it for the uh, one of those beginner type tools. So I mean, th that's what you need to tie, you know, eighty percent of your flies, even more. Uh, that'll get you a good good base to get you started tying and tying good flies. Uh, so now we're going to get into a little bit more of the uh, specialty tools or you know tools that I use for. Um, you know, certain tasks that I've found that just work better than these, you know, along the way. And um, first I'm going to do uh, some tying wax. And um, what I use mostly is this little chunk right here. And what this is is uh, a mix of some of this uh, Wopsy dubbing wax and UTC wax. And I think this is... This is just like normal thread wax or something like that, but um, the problem that I had with both of these is that this is way too soft and a little bit too tacky for you know what I wanted. And this is the exact opposite. This is really hard and um, does have some tack to it. It's really good for getting thread to grip, like when you're building up a head or something like that. And this is pretty good for uh, just a normal dubbing wax. But um, what I wanted to do is combine those two properties so that I have you know, one hunk of lead, that, or lead, hunk of uh, wax that can do the same thing, or do everything that I need. So um, I melted these two together and you know, mixed them together and stuff, and I think it was, you know, like one part this to two parts this or something like that, and wound up with a really nice uh, piece of wax, and this has lasted me um, quite a long time, at least, you know, about two years, I'd say, a year or two years. So um, this stuff will go a long way as long as you take care of it. So um, good to have some wax around. And then you know, what I use for like touch dub or like as a true dubbing wax is this stuff, the Loon Low Tack Swax. And the uh, High Tack is really, really High Tack. So I, I like the Low Tack that gets, you know, everything that I need out of it. And um, really, really sticky stuff, pretty soft. So great for dubbing wax. Especially like touch dub and stuff like that. I use the uh, this little bit for just normal dubbing wax, but um, good for touch dub stuff like that. So good to have a little bit of this around. And then once you get all that dubbing on, uh, it's you always want to pick it out a little bit just to make the fly more buggy and give it a little bit more life or life. So um, what I've been doing, I got this as a a freebie on uh, one of my J Stalker's orders and. I had like a coupon code for it or something like that but this is really handy I really like the, the uh, little comb here it's great for under fur and stuff like that but the uh, velcro is what you use most of the time for dubbing and um, this is pretty good um, actually I like using the uh, cheap popsicle stick method for this and um, why I like this better is that I mean, see how thick that is that's you know fairly thick probably about an eighth inch and you know, some of the flies it gets really hard to get under there with the body all built up under the uh, between the hook shank and the hook point and you can see this one's even got uh, some scratches on it from the hook point so this one I mean I, I can even get under you know down to like size 18 flies to pick up that body with this and um, just plain old popsicle stick with some bits of velcro stuck on and this is a uh, little bit of a longer Velcro, and this one's a little bit shorter and a little bit stouter, so it uh, just gives me a little bit of options to uh, play around with. Sometimes this will work better, sometimes this will work better, so it's just nice to have both on one end. And, um, you know, what I was doing for a while is just a little piece of Velcro like this wrapped onto the end of a pen, and that works good for big flies. Um, it really does open up those uh, Velcro fibers to let them grab onto stuff, but um, pretty much under a size 2 or, you know, for this is pretty much worthless so um, really like the popsicle stick honestly it's the best tool you can have on your vice for or on your bench for under a dollar right, and while well, we're on the topic of dubbing too a uh, little dubbing spinner and this one is a really fancy one I can't remember how much I paid for it but it's it's really nice it's you know you can get the whole job done just by like that and stop it and goes really really quick and it's got these nice interchangeable heads so I can uh, switch them out in no time just for different kinds of thread or different 
dubbings that I'm using. And, um, I, re I really do prefer this style. I've been using this a lot more. I started out with this and ended up with this. Um, this one's really nice. You can adjust the tension on the thread pretty well and it, it, it keeps tension while you're adjusting, I guess, adjusting the um, space between the um, threads for, for building dubbing loops. And um, there are the normal size kind with the uh, stick hanging off or just like a kind of like this with the weight on the bottom. Those work really well. Uh, I just like this style a little bit better. Really quick for me. And um, it, it has a little hair stack on it. I've used that a few times. It, it works pretty good. But, um, anyways, moving down down the line. Um, another thing to keep on your bench is a uh, nice pair of clippers. And um, these are just some fishing nipper clippers that I had a uh, had an I used for a while, and I just like the smaller size better for fishing, but this one's really nice. It's got a uh, little thing on the end here. This is great for untying knots. I also do a lot of uh, maintenance with my fly lines and leaders and stuff on the bench, so it's great for undoing maybe, you know, wind knots or uh, novice knots, as I call them, and uh, got a little knife and bottle opener and stuff on there, so nice to have on the bench, and um, this is great for you know, cutting off thicker materials, really thick uh, stems or uh, even some like articulation wire or trailer wire, stuff like that. But um, nice to keep around. You will end up doling out these uh, cutting edges pretty quick on some of that heavier wire. So that's why I keep these around. That's a little pair of uh, flush cutters or dikes, whatever you want to call them. And um, this is what I keep for articulation wire. Uh, bead chain eyes, um, trailer wire, stuff like that. Really um, the heavy coarse cutting of things. And um, these you won't don't have to worry about doling them out or uh, chipping them or nicking them or anything like that. They're you know, st stoutest thing on the bench. So good to have a pair of these around. You won't ruin any of your scissors or anything like that with these. So good to have around. Um, next we'll do some hackle pliers. And this is kind of my preferred style of hacker, hackle plier. Um, these are really nice because it's got this head that goes back and forth and also rotates so it doesn't end up you know, twisting up your uh, hackles while you're uh, twisting them. And um, grip, grips on really well. It's just uh, the normal kind of plier end. And um, they're really good because they, they spin really free and makes really quick work of long hackles and these are another kind that I've been playing around with um, these work okay on hackles um, a lot of people swear by them I just um, not my favorite I really like that other style but these are great for uh, working with small hooks or anything like that and they do do work on hackles and um, kind of neat tool these are really really cheap so you can pick up four or five of them no problem and, uh, you do have your uh, standard style. I'll see if I, yeah, I got a little pair of them here. These are just kind of your standard cheap pliers that come in just about every kit. And uh, these are just kind of the twisted wires kind. And um, these work great. They grab on, but um, you can see that gripping surface. It's only really at the very, very end. So you got to be careful where you put the um, hackle stem in because uh, it won't always grip really well. And you know, they both the hackle coming unwound and everything that's pain in the butt but all right so next we have uh, some tweezers and um, these I honestly when I first started out I thought I was gonna be using these a whole lot more than I do <laughs> and um, you know you will not be using this to apply materials onto flies or anything like that um, mainly what I use these for now is just uh, picking out beads if I need you know maybe one bead out of a bunch or um, I keep my hooks in uh, these little bins right here, and some of these smaller ones, you know, you go in to go pick out one, and they're all twisted together, so you end up, you know, with fat fingers like I have, you know, you can't get out just one, so you end up with five or six of them stuck in your finger, because, you know, you're sitting there poking at them. So, little tweezers for the smaller ones, it works great. Uh, they're handy to have around just in case you need them, but um, like I said, you won't be using them in the actual 
tying of the fly, at least, you know, what I've seen so far. Um, also, some razors. Uh, razors are good around, good to have around for, uh, this kind is great for um, cutting materials, uh, you know, shaping heads, stuff like that. They're super, super sharp. They're pretty flexible, so um, it's hard to do some heavy cutting, but they're so sharp that they just sail right through anything. And um, the other kind is this dial right here, and this is what I use for um, cutting tubes for tube flies or um, any more you know heavy-duty type cutting. And um, these I can't find anywhere around town. I have to order them off of uh, Amazon or you know somewhere like that. They're just normal shaving razors. But um, these you can pick up at just about any hardware store for you know a dollar for a hundred of them. So. Um, Definitely worth having around. They come in handy every now and then. And now more into really specialty tools. I mean, these are something that you'll hardly ever use um, unless you tie a lot of tube flies. This is a tube fly vice adapter. So what this does is that this clamps into your vise just like this, and then uh, you can undo this little brass knob, and then your pin will pull out. And you slide your tube onto the pin. And it comes up to that little angle right there, and that keeps it from sliding off the end. And then you slide this back in, just until the tube meets up to that little, uh, call it, I guess, right there, that little ring. Right to where it touches that, and then you can tighten everything back down. It'll hold the tube on there really steady, so you can do all your tying, and you don't have to worry about it going anywhere. And uh, this adapter came with a, a smaller pen, too. So little guy for smaller tubes and stuff like that. And um, one thing that I found on my, my vice, my uh, Montana Mongoose, is that these pins can be a little bit too long. They kind of butt up to the back of the vice, so um, you can't always grab the really small tubes. And most of the tubes that I tie are about that size or smaller. So I just uh, clip the end off a little bit just so it'll fit nice on my vice. I mean, you're hardly ever going to tie anything that big. Most of them are going to be about that big, so you're not losing anything on the end. And that's you know only if you're gonna tie some tube flies, and it's a great way to tie flies. I've got a whole bunch of them. So um, next is these uh, little body pins, extended body pins, and um, these it's kind of the same concept. This little bit right here clamps into your vise. You can tie, tie uh, extended bodies for um, you know, like crane flies or even small mayflies and stuff like that on this. And um, really hard to do it without them. Uh, I've done it before on like sewing needles and stuff but um, this is definitely a really really easy option and uh, they're fairly cheap too you get a whole set of them I um, can't remember how much I paid for them but not too bad when you consider how much easier it makes tying extended body flies and they've got like a little material clip here they can hook your materials and threads and stuff in so pretty neat and then next are some foam body cutters and these you know it's they're not very cheap but they save you a lot of time when you're tying foam bodied flies and um, this one here is for uh, grasshopper pattern um, can't remember off the top of my head what they're called but um, like the supreme hopper I forget what the guy's name was that came up with the pattern but um, really neat they come in handy to make really really quick work of cutting uh, foam bodies and you know before even like a Chernobyl ant like this guy here you know you cut two of these it takes you about what, 45 seconds for a minute to cut them out perfect out of foam with scissors and this you know you can cut through two in you know 30 seconds and if you're tying three or four dozen of them it saves you about a couple hours worth of work so uh, really good to have around um, if you're going to be tying a lot of those foam flies. Uh, like I said, not super cheap. If you buy like the individuals, like this uh, Chernobyl ant, they're not too bad. But if you buy like the whole set for these uh, Supreme Hoppers, they get pretty pri pricey pretty quick, especially if you want to tie them in more than one size. But um, really neat tools. Really great to have if you're going to be tying a lot of those. And um, I think that's pretty much it for... Um, yeah, pretty much it for 
a lot of the general tools that I use quite a bit of. Um, in the next video we're going to be going over how we're going to use some of these tools and um, I'm not going to go into you know how we're going to use this guy um, at least in that video uh, or you know, tube fly vice or anything like that. I'm just going to show you basic ways on how to practice with your tools and how to practice with your materials so you can get to tying butterflies faster. Uh, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, or anything like that, you can go and put them down in the comment section below. Um, I'd be more than happy to give you guys some feedback, or if you guys give me some feedback, I'd be more than happy to get that from you. So, hope you enjoyed watching. Thanks for watching.